at your name The mountains shake and crumble At your name The oceans roar and tumble At your name
I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Sing that declaration again. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. that declaration that we we enter into our time of prayer if you've been with us for the past month or so we just we pray together and so this morning as I was just reading scripture uh, the Holy Spirit just impressed on me that as we make this declaration that that maybe we need to set our hearts towards that way I think sometimes you and I we, we can become um, almost arrogant to the point where we we tell God what we're going to do and we tell God how we're going to do it when we're going to do it. And so t- tonight, before we launch into a new sermon series in Acts, I just, I wanted us to stop for a moment. And that we would maybe just take the posture tonight of those that are, are not their own, those that have been bought with a price. And so I'm going to invite you, whatever that looks like, you would ask the Holy Spirit what that would mean in your life. Maybe you're hurting tonight and you can't, you can't look past your hurt or your pain. We're going to have people here along the front that, that want to pray with you and for you. And so you can make your way down front in a moment. Maybe there's somebody that, that God has, has, has put on your heart to pray for, for their salvation. That's what these sticky notes are for. You can come grab one. There's pins here. and Just jot their name down. As, as one body, let's, as we enter kind of a new time of history of our church, may we be found, may we be a people found in prayer. As our deacons and elders, they'll be making their way down front now. This is your time. Maybe, um, maybe you were with us last week and, and I read a passage of scripture in, in James 5 and uh, it talked about if any of our sick and in need uh, to come and, and have an elder pray with them, pray for their well-being. Also part of that scripture, James 5, it talked about us confessing sin one to another and praying for one another. And so maybe it looks like you just leaning over to the person next to you and, and saying, would you just pray for me? Not that you have to go into great detail about sin or anything like that, but maybe that person next to you could, could carry that burden for you and with you. So this is your time. If you need to come, come now. If you need to just sit and pray, you can sit and pray. This is your time. You pray. Father, forgive us of our arrogance. Tonight, may we approach you as people that are bought with a great price. People with such a great debt they, they can never repay. People that are humbled by such a gracious God. Father, may we understand that when we said yes to you, we said yes to your mission and whatever that looks like. confidence that we we stand and we can pray.
pray and we can praise and worship and we can know that you hear us because of your son, Jesus Christ, and the blood that was shed. We love you and we just, that great love propels us tonight to, to sing to you, to pray to you, hear and apply your word. This next song that we're going to do is a song that we've done here before, and the song is just called Glorious Ruin. Because you and I know that because of sin, you and I are, are very ruined people. But because of God's great grace and his love for his people, he provided a way to make us glorious. And there's a passage of scripture that illustrates this perfectly, and let me read it over you. It's Ephesians chapter 2, and just beginning verse 1. Many of you have heard this over and over again. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. In verse 4 it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. By grace, we have been saved. May our hearts be stirred tonight. May we come to life tonight because of what Christ Jesus has done for you and I.
Because of that, we worship, we sing, we give, we go. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Mercy and grace, oh, 
Good evening, good evening, 7 o'clock. How are you guys tonight? Awesome, awesome. I don't know about you, but that song challenges me every time I hear it. What does it mean for, uh, for me to surrender? I mean, even more. What does it mean for me to place myself uh, in the hands of God in, in such a way that he would use... He would use me in a greater way than he's, than he's used me before. Uh, what does it mean for me to lay my life down even more for God to, to be able to work in and through my life? What does it mean for me to surrender, to give it away, to place myself in a, in a position that doesn't feel so maybe protected uh, or insulated? It's a challenging song to work through. It's a challenging song to have sung over us, isn't it? Yeah really is. Tonight, before we get started, we're starting a new series in the book of Acts called Sent. And before we get there, I wanted to remind you of a couple of things and ask you to pray about a couple of things in regards to this fellowship, this body. Uh, it, the first one has to do with camp. You guys probably saw the announcement if you're in here early enough to see Stonegate News. Camp's a big deal around here. It really is. And it's a big deal, not because it's a great event. It is a great event. I think we put on one of the best camps in the country. Honestly, it's just fantastic. But it's a great event because God moves at camp. Uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, just for fun, how many of you in this room, uh, you can remember a time where God moved in your life at camp? Raise your, raise your hand up. Wow, yeah, a lot of you. It's fantastic. Me too. I mean, camp's just one of those times in life where we're kind of sequestered. Um, you know, cell phones these days are taken away and we're away from TV and, and just... It's that moment where God speaks. And so there's a couple of things I'm gonna ask of you tonight. Number one, begin praying. If you haven't started praying, begin praying for camp. Even if you don't have a kid going, um, just start praying for camp. Start praying that God would do that thing that he does in the lives of students and that students' hearts would be open and responsive to the work and power of the Holy Spirit at camp. It's coming up the first week of June. It's, and it, it, it's an exciting time. Another way that you can help out with camp this year, uh, we've got a lot of students that are going that just simply can't afford camp. So if the Lord uh, impresses upon your heart to help scholarship a student to camp, uh, we're just putting that before the body, not to guilt you, not not to ask you for something you're not willing to do or that God doesn't impress on your heart to do. But literally, we've had hundreds of people already come forward to say, you know what, I'll do a partial scholarship or a full scholarship for camp. So if that is something that the Lord presses on your heart to do, uh, you can do that. You can write a check for a kid to go to camp. Uh, last year, we scholarshiped about $30,000, I think, worth of, of camp scholarships. Um, and you say, wow, that's a lot of students. Well, we took 700 7th through 12th grade students last year to camp. Honestly, this year, we hope to break the 1,000 mark. We, ho we hope to take more students to camp this year. We have more beds to offer. The past few years, we've, just, we've run out of beds. We've run out of places to put students. And then, here's the third way you can get involved. We are moving to an encampment, Glorietta, New Mexico, where God has opened up an opportunity for us to partner with a, a, a really great group of, of uh, an organization that focuses on camp. And they bought Glorietta. Uh, some of you that might have some Baptist roots would remember Glorietta being owned by the Southern Baptist Convention. And they've had camps there for years. And uh, basically that whole deal went bankrupt and they had to get rid of Glorietta. This, these, this group came in and bought it. And uh, we've uh, kind of partnered with them over the next five to 10 years to help them get that camp back up to the level they want it to be so that they can continue to impact students. So uh, here's a third way you can get involved. Uh, you've probably seen these announcements, but I'm gonna give you one last push. And this is just for men in the room. Sorry, women, we're trying to work up a trip for you. But about a month ago, we had 45 men from this body go to Glorietta and just begin to, to do work in the trades uh, of the men that went. Some were plumbers, uh, some were uh, uh, 
builders, some new HVAC, and some of them were just like me, that when they went and started a project, they caused three more problems. So there's a place for you. This Friday morning at 6 a.m., there's going to be another busload of men, I think. Uh, at the beginning of this day, they had about 20. Now, I think they're up to about 35 after this announcement in services and men just responding. Um, you know, those 45 men went a month ago, and they were 30 days behind being ready for camp. In a day and a half, they gave a thousand man hours worth of work and got them within a two week window of being ready for camp. And so we're going back. There's all kinds of work to be done there. And so if that's something that you can just, if you haven't planned on and God stirs in your heart, you want to be a part of, they're leaving this Friday morning at 6 a.m. We'll be back Sunday at about four. And from what I understand, uh, they just get after it. So if you'd like to be a part of that, then we'd love for you to be a part of that. One final thing. Please continue to be praying for um, our twin. Did you know we're having twins? Uh, We're having twins here at Stonegate Fellowship. Not me, uh, but at Stonegate Fellowship. Uh, we We are really close to finishing up our four orientation classes for Stonegate Odessa. And the reason why I say we're having twins is we don't see Stonegate Midland as the quote unquote mothership. What we want to do is have two equal bodies, uh, one church in two locations, one in Odessa and one in Midland. And so if God has been stirring on your heart and you haven't stepped out in faith and followed him on that yet to see what he's up to in your life, you have one more opportunity to hit an orientation meeting. That's going to happen Wednesday night at uh, the new MCH facility. It's the kind of the new hot piece of the hospital on the left-hand side as you um, are headed towards Odessa. That's going to be at 7 p.m. in their fitness room there. So if that is something that God might be stirring in your heart, uh, please uh, follow suit on that. Uh, Because I'll, I'll say this to you very lovingly. If he wants you to go, you need to go. If he wants you to be a part of something that's grassroots, it's, it's risky, it's, it's building it from the ground up, it's blood, sweat, and tears, it's a lot of prayer, it's a lot of hard work. If that's something that, that just starts stirring your heart, maybe you need to think about that. If God wants you to be a part of starting Stonegate Fellowship in Odessa. Let's have a word of prayer and then we are gonna find ourselves in uh, Acts chapter one tonight. Let's pray together. Father, thanks for our time together this evening, and I simply pray that your spirit would lead us during this time to think about the things that we need to think about and to hear the things that we need to hear. Um, Father, I pray just for direction and understanding in regards to what it means to uh, be sent, to live on mission as followers who have decided to follow Jesus. So uh, help us during this time, Father, to meet with you. Thank you for being here with us in this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. We are starting this series in the book of Acts tonight. And what I like to do to kind of lay a foundation for us this evening is just to talk a little bit about what was going on as we pick up uh, the book of Acts. We're going to be working through it in the next eight weeks together. And uh, it's important for us to kind of get a feel for what was going on uh, during this time. And and the reason why we we stop and pause and take time to do this with you is we know that... um, Many people that God, that God is bringing into our fellowship, they're just coming from different places. Honestly, I said this in the 11 o'clock service and, and a, a young family came up to me afterwards and said, you know, this is the first time we've been in church ever. And they stepped into Stonegate Fellowship this morning having no background, no biblical background. The husband had never owned a Bible in his life. We walked right back to Stonegate Fellowship and picked up his first copy of God's Word and he left today with it. Amazing that God is bringing people from all kinds of different places. So when we step into Scripture, we like to take a little bit of time to say, okay, this is, this is where we are in the text. This is what the Bible's talking about right here. So if you can imagine this. The author, of Luke, the author of Acts is a guy named Luke. He's the same guy that wrote the gospel of Luke. So the gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So the third gospel, the gospel of Luke, the writer there is the same guy that wrote the book of Acts. And the, the gospels really told the story of Jesus. So between the Old Testament and the New Testament period, there were 400 years of silence God did not speak. There was no prophet. There were no writings that are included in what we call our Bible today during that time period, 400 years of silence. And then Jesus is birthed. 
And there are writers like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who begin to uh, write down the things that they saw from an eyewitness account. They begin to, to catalog some things, not all of them, but the things that God wanted us to see and understand about the life of Jesus. And so during that tumultuous time when God came in the flesh and lived on earth and then went to the cross on our behalf and then three days later was resurrected from the dead, there's this time period that, that we're picking up in in the book of Acts where Jesus was resurrected from the grave and then he spent 40 days basically showing himself and, and demonstrating that he was who he said he was. And so Luke, as a matter of fact, let's just, let's for grins, go back to the last chapter of Luke. Get your copy of God's word and go to Luke chapter 24, verse 46. And what I wanna do is kind of bridge the gap from the gospel of Luke to Acts chapter one. You see at this time period for 40 days, Jesus is showing himself to, to those that were uh, both believers and, and non-believers, that he, that he was who he said, those who believed that he was who he said he was and those who didn't believe that he was the Messiah. He was presenting himself as the risen savior. And so you can imagine the time, it was a difficult time. It was a time where the apostles, the disciples were wondering, what do we do from here? I mean, Jesus is resurrected from the grave. Now he's talking about leaving. Some of them in the group of disciples were doubting you know, there were, is, is Jesus really resurrected from the dead? Is he really alive? I mean, some of them probably like you and me were thinking, okay, if I were writing the script, I wouldn't have written it this way. I mean, Jesus now has conquered death for us just like he said he was, but now he said he's leaving. Wouldn't it be better if he stayed with us? Maybe they would have written it that way. And so Luke in the 24th chapter of his gospel as kind of a, a, a ramp into the book of Acts for us writes this in the 46th verse. He says, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Now capture that idea there. That he's saying that Jesus is who he says he was. He, he came and he suffered. He was dead, but he uh, rose on the third day. And now we have a way for us to find repentance and forgiveness of sins. And then he says, this should be proclaimed to all nations. So here we already have the glimpse of where he's going in Acts chapter one, this idea of us being sent, this idea of us being on mission, that we're responsible to live a life on mission. So he goes on in verse 48. He says, you are witnesses of these things. You've experienced it. You've been a part of it. So in verse 49, behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you. But stay in this city until you are clothed with power on high. What is he talking about there? He's talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about for the first time, the Spirit of God is getting, getting ready to indwell man. In the Old Testament, God was, was with people and the presence of God was with people during the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the presence of God was with people through Jesus, God in the flesh. Now Jesus is getting ready to leave and we see that we're getting ready to enter into a time period that you and I live in today where we're not without the presence of God at all. That he's sending the promised one, the Holy Spirit. And those who have said, I have decided to follow Jesus for the first time in the history of mankind, the Spirit of God is going to jump inside of man in the temple of the Holy Spirit, as we're described in the New Testament. Go on and look at verse 50. This is a beautiful picture. Then Jesus led them out as far as Bethany. In other words, he told them to go to Jerusalem and to wait there, that he was gonna send the Spirit. But he led them out as far as Bethany. And imagine Jesus, he's lifting up his hands and he blessed them. While he blessed them in verse 51, he parted from them and was carried up to heaven. And we'll begin to see this again in the book of Acts here in just a moment. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Here's the big idea for today. 
The big idea is this, that we have a personal responsibility to engage the mission of the church. And let me say that in a very personal way directly to you. You have a personal responsibility to engage the mission of the church. As a matter of fact, if you draw breath today, you exist to engage the responsibility of carrying out this mission that Jesus was getting ready to transfer to the disciples in Acts chapter one. Before we move forward though, I wanna talk to you about a couple of words that if we're not careful, will get us hung up. As a matter of fact, the first word is mission. When we talk about the idea of us being responsible with the mission that has been entrusted to us, if we are not careful, especially if you've been in church for a pretty long time, when you hear the word mission, you think of missions. You think of uh, going to Africa or being sent to China or maybe being sent to Romania or God forbid that you might be sent to some remote jungle on the other side of the world. I say that tongue in cheek because I think honestly, the easiest thing for anybody in this room is that God would say to you, go to Africa, go to China. Go to the remote jungle on the other side of the world and talk about me when you get there. I think that's the easiest thing for us when we talk about this idea of mission. The more difficult thing when we talk about this idea of mission is unpacking it in this way. What does it mean for us as individuals in Midland, Texas to live on mission? What does that look like? The idea of being sent, if we're not careful on mission, will send us into this kind of growing up in church mentality where we think of the mission field being something that is far away to people who have never heard the message of the gospel. The reality is God may be calling you there. The reality is God may be calling you to some foreign field where you're supposed to stand for the gospel there and even risk your very existence of life for the sake of the mission. If he does so, that may be the easiest and most fulfilling call on your life. For most of us in this room, we have to understand and unpack this idea of mission in this regard. The idea of us being sent, you were sent to be here where you are now in Midland, Texas. So what does it mean for us to live on mission. We're going to unpack that together as we move forward. One other word tonight I want us to, to kind of talk about before we move, move on is this word church. You've heard us talk a lot from this stage, whoever's teaching. You've heard us talk a lot about this, this reality that this, this building, this, this corner that we come and gather in is not the church. As a matter of fact, there are buildings all over the world with steeples on them but that, that's not the church. The, the church is not a denomination or an organization. You're the church. If you've decided to follow Jesus, you are, as an individual, a part of the church. You see, it's something that is, it is about our heart and not something that's about an entity called the church. So when we talk about living on mission, we're talking about a heart stance that the church takes, not in here, but out there. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you yourself You're the church, you're the, because the church is the dwelling place of God. And so if you're a follower of Christ, if you've, if you've given your life over, if you've said, I surrender, I lay my life down and I take the life that you've give, given to me. Then God takes up residence in you and you yourself become the temple of the Holy Spirit as is described to us in the New Testament. So the only thing special about this gathering is that people who are the church, who are submitted to the Spirit's power in our lives, great things happen when we come together as the church because the Holy Spirit of God is in us and he's empowering us to do great things in the marketplace. 
has very little, very little to do with this gathering. It has a whole lot to do with who we are when we're scattered out in the marketplace. But it's a matter of the heart, not about a building, not about a gathering, not about a place. The mission is about who we're gonna be out in the marketplace. To unpack this a little bit further, I wanna show you how we got this responsibility to live on mission, to be, to be sent. And I want you to wrestle with this phrase a little bit. The work of Jesus is both finished and unfinished. Jesus came and, and, and lived a life as God in the flesh, both God and man on our behalf so that we could be in a right relationship with God when we place our faith in what he was able to do for us that we could not do for ourselves, reconcile us to God, redeem us, to, to provide a way for us to be in a relationship with him. So the finished work of Jesus is this. It's the great work he provided in salvation from, for sin for us. That is finished. Nothing can be added to that. There is no other way. That was God's plan. As a matter of fact, before Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God had already decided, it's written in the scripture, in the scripture that Christ was slain before the foundation of the earth. That tells us that God already knew Adam and Eve would, would disobey in the garden and they already had the provision in place for Jesus to come and do the work for us on the cross, more importantly through the resurrection from the grave that we might taste of life after death. That was already at work in the plan of God before Adam and Eve ever chose to disobey God. That's the finished work of Christ. Nothing can be added to it. That's why our works don't matter in regards to salvation. Our works don't move us into a right relationship with God. They don't help at all. Only the finished work of Christ, freeing us from sin, saving us from our sinful nature that leads us to sin. Only his work can usher us in to the family of God. Nothing can be added to it. That's the finished work of Christ. The scripture talks about that in John chapter 17. This is often referred to as the priestly prayer. It's the prayer Jesus has. It's, it's when he's talking to God right before he's getting ready to, to leave the disciples. And, and he's gonna go back and enjoy the glory that he had with the Father before he came here. And Jesus says this, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now here's our key verse, verse six. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me. Jesus is saying here, I have finished the work that you've sent me to accomplish. I have manifested your name to the people. Manifested just means to draw a realistic picture of who God is. That's what Jesus did. He manifested, he made known the name and heart of God to the people. It's the finished work of Christ. The finished work of Christ is, is about redemption. It's complete. And all who place their faith in this finished work of Christ are welcomed into the family of God. And see, this is where the, the idea of our responsibility starts being birthed. The reality is there is no better place than to be in the family of God. And I don't know where you are tonight. You may be like the young family that I talked to after 11 o'clock service. You just stumbled in here tonight. Maybe you're seated here tonight wondering why we even gather week after week in this setting. You may be hearing these songs that we sing week after week and go, I don't hear these on my radio dial. I don't know where you are tonight, but I will say to you tonight that the finished work of Christ, that he came to pave a way for you to be in a relationship with God, and not only that, but to partake in a family of God where you are received and accepted and loved, and where you'll find your greatest joy, that is what the finished work of Jesus offers us. The Bible talks about it, that in this way in John chapter one and verse 12, those who received him, that is those who have decided to follow Jesus, who have believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's the finished work of Christ. But herein lies our responsibility. The unfinished work of Christ is this, his work of ministry and proclamation is not finished. 
Jesus came and started a ministry that he will, where he ushered in the kingdom of God. He began that process and the kingdom work will be fulfilled when he comes back and sets up his kingdom reign as the king of that kingdom where he has his millennial reign, his thousand year reign on this earth. He has started a work that he will finish and the beautiful thing is God invites us into the story. He invites us into the mission. And so where the ministry and proclamation, and proclamation is just the telling of the story, that's not finished. We are invited into that. And in fact, our responsibility is taking seriously the telling of the story and the appeal to the marketplace, to the culture that God wants to make through our lives. So in Acts chapter one, I told you we'd get there. The first verse reads this way. I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Remember, this is Luke picking up where the gospel of Luke left off. And he's saying, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. That was in his gospel until the day when he had given the commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Do you remember the command? The command we read in Luke 24, go to Jerusalem and wait. The Holy Spirit is coming. In verse three, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during the 40 day period and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while he was staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. An amazing thing we're gonna be talking about next week. What does it mean to live a life empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. So when we come to this first chapter of Acts, we come to a major transition in the scripture, a major transition in passed on responsibility. You see the disciples up to this point, now they're, they're waiting in Jerusalem for about a 10 day period. They're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And so they're, they're, they have been with Jesus through his ministry, as Luke recorded in the Gospel of Luke. They'd seen that all, all he had done, they'd seen the miracles, they'd, they'd seen people brought back to life, they'd seen lepers healed of their diseases, they'd seen demons cast out of people, they'd seen Jesus go to the cross, crucified, die on their behalf, and then they were witnesses and partakers of the resurrection and then him appearing to them for 40 days. And so now they're there waiting and something amazing happens. You see, while they were walking with Jesus, all the while they were apprentices. They were disciples. They were ones who were learning about ministry, learning about the bigger story of God. But now in the book of Acts, this major transition happens. And Jesus comes to them and he says, I'm transferring that responsibility for the mission on to you. And it is now your time, it is your season, disciples, to pick up this responsibility and to be my witnesses, first in Jerusalem, and then in the city surrounding that, and then in the city surrounding that, and then to all of the nations. And so he was beginning to unpack this idea of being responsible with a mission. Look at chapter one and verse eight. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's important. The mission, and I'll talk about this more next week, but the mission is not on our shoulders in the sense that we're responsible for coming up with everything that we're supposed to do to fulfill the mission. No, it's, it's key here that Jesus didn't say go and do. He said go and wait. He didn't say go and, go and do all of these things. He said go and wait and I will send the Holy Spirit that will empower you to carry out the mission. And so he said wait to receive the power from the Holy Spirit. And when it's come upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him up into the air. And while they were gazing, check this out, while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood with him in white robes, two angels. These two men stood with him in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. Here's what I think the angels were getting after there. 
Guys, why are you just standing looking around? What else are you looking for God to do? Why do you just stand here and wait when Jesus just released you? He hasn't left you alone. As a matter of fact, he said, I must go so that the Father will send the Spirit who will empower you to do the mission. And I have to teach you a little bit here about how I, I place myself under the Scriptures. And so when I read something like that, I begin to look at my own life and try to place myself back in that setting. And then to think about how does that work itself out in my life in regards to what I'm doing to engage the mission today. And I wonder sometimes in my own life if God's angels, if he still spoke verbally, audibly through them, by the way, they're in this room right now, we can't see them, but we're promised that they're here and so is the spirit of God. He is with us as we're gathered. But what if he spoke audibly right now? And I place myself under the word to ask myself this question and I would, I would invite you to ask yourself this question. Would an angel or would God himself say to me, why are you standing around? What are you, what are you looking for? Jesus has said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna, I'm gonna validate myself and I'm gonna manifest the name of God. I'm gonna tell the story of who God is and he's a redeeming God and a loving God and then I'm gonna pass that responsibility on to the disciples and then the disciples have passed that responsibility on to Christ followers since the first century until today. And so we sit here gathered together under the responsibility that was given to the disciples and then to the disciples behind them and the disciples that came after them. And now we have come after them. And I just wonder, would God say to me, why are you just standing around? Engage the mission, you're ready. And I don't wanna dilute the scripture because it does not say this in the scripture, but maybe the disciples still felt like this. Like you and I feel sometimes, I'm not ready. As a matter of fact, I'm scared to death. I mean, what does it even mean to engage the mission in the marketplace? And maybe the disciples just in that moment were going, oh God, what what do we do now? And if we're not careful, we can stay in that position or that stance all of our lives. When in fact, we're ready right now because we've been empowered and gifted with the spirit of God. If you're a believer, he's in you and you're ready and don't let a church background or a church denomination or hopefully anything we've ever said in our teaching say that you are not ready because you are ready. It's a lie of the enemy that says that you have got to somehow Get ready and mature and mature and mature and mature and mature before God's gonna use you. That's, that's simply not biblical. When Jesus came to the disciples in the New Testament as recorded by Luke and the other writers of the four gospels, Jesus came to ordinary men who, by the way, didn't make the, pass the spiritual test to be a rabbi, so they went back to trades like fishermen and tent makers and so on and so forth. Those are the guys that Jesus went to and he came to them and he said, drop everything and follow me. What we default to and think about church as an entity and the mission in America, we tend to think that we're supposed to come into church as followers of Jesus Christ and have all of our needs met. Here's a list of all the needs that I feel like I have and I want you to start praying for these and I want you to meet my needs and as soon as those needs are met, I'm gonna be happy and then I might engage the mission. That's a farce, that's a lie of the enemy. Don't buy into that. We don't see that in the New Testament. We see Jesus walking up to men who certainly had needs in their lives but he said, drop everything and engage real life with me on mission and here's what happened. He didn't sit those guys down and go, okay, guys, tell me your needs and I'll work on all of those and get you all patched up and ready to go and then we'll go do ministry together. He didn't do that. The New Testament picture of mission is drop everything and follow Jesus and as you are following him on mission, your needs will be met. And in fact, when we're on mission with Jesus, we'll find out that the needs that we really thought were our needs weren't our needs in the first place. Our need was to depend on him to be all that he is in us so that we can experience the joy of living on mission. 
That's what you were born for. That's what you were created for, to live on mission. That's what life is really all about. Not about having our needs met before, but having our needs met along the way, walking with Jesus and allowing him to do that thing in, that he does in us to prepare us for what's ahead. Listen, and, 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 and the greatest moments in your life will be when you think you're not prepared, but God shows you that you were prepared because his spirit was ready to work in and through you when you had the faith to step out and risk trusting him. Those are beautiful moments in life. Here's our current reality. There are many who have come before us that have been faithful to the call and devoted to the mission of the church. That's the reality. You're seated here today because somebody took seriously the responsibility of living a life on mission. Now, let me just kind of tear down some walls here. What does it mean to live on mission? It's not this far out thing that's untouchable. It just simply means that you live a kind of life that displays Jesus in front of others. That's what, that's what Jesus said. I have manifested the Father. I have, I have lived a life that has displayed a realistic picture of who God the Father is. What does it mean to live on, li- on mission? That you simply live in such a way that gets Jesus on display in front of other people. It's not complicated. But our current reality is, is many have been faithful, but this is our season. This is our time to be faithful. This is our moment in history where God says, here, take the responsibility of the mission and take it to the marketplace. Be a church that understands what it means to be the church, to have God actively at work in your own personal life, but that being the church is more about being the church in the scattered environment that we call the marketplace of the culture versus in this safe environment that we call the gathered church setting. This is our season. This is our time. And God will use us if we will yield to him empowered by the Spirit to fulfill what we are supposed to fulfill in this season that he's given us. Second Corinthians chapter five talks about this truth. Therefore, if anyone's in, in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God. <clears throat> Through Christ was reconciling us to himself and gave us the ministry of of reconciliation. Verse 19, it continues, that is this, that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, their sin, their wrongdoings against him. For those who place their faith in Jesus, God does not count their trespasses against them. And to those, these people who are faithful, he entrusted the message of reconciliation to them. Reconciliation is a big word. It just means that Jesus came to reconcile us, to draw us to God because we could not get to him on our own. Nothing that we could do would cause God to say, you're accepted except for the fact that we placed our faith in the one who makes us acceptable, Jesus. The scripture goes on to say in verse 20 though, really beautiful here though, now we are ambassadors for Christ. Where's representative and God is making his appeal through you. What does it mean to live a life on mission? It means that you live the, a, a stance in life where God can make his appeal through the way you live. The fruit in your life. I'll say it to you this way, that the people that you work with, the people that you spend most of your time with, which is probably not your family. It's probably the people that you work with. That is your most important time. This is your most important season to get God on display in and through your life wherever he's placed you in the marketplace. Let me emphasize it this way. Consider your work, your platform. It's it's the place that God has, has orchestrated in your life through the school of hard knocks or, or through education or through the self-made man or self-made woman or, or, or because you, he, he invited you into a corporation or organization. He has placed you where you are in the job that you do. He's given you a platform. 
He's given you a platform to put Jesus on display and the things that you do and say in that environment, in that platform, catch this, the things that you say and do in that environment, in the platform that he's given you, in the marketplace is much more important than the platform I stand on today teaching you or any person who stands on this stage teaching you. This platform where we're able to speak into your lives on a a once a week basis is minuscule. It pales in comparison to the platform that he's given you in the marketplace. You know what it means to be a pastor? It means to be a person who shepherds and tries to equip you to be successful in the platform that God's given you in the marketplace, to make much of his name, to draw a realistic picture of who he is, to live on mission. And your platform will have greater impact than this platform will. Now you may be wrestling with that, but I know I'm right. It's it's the same principle where Jesus said in the scripture, When he was leaving, and this tripped me up for years, but he said, you will do greater things than you've seen me do. Like, what? How can you do greater things than dying on the cross for somebody? How can you do a greater thing than being resurrected from the dead and being the salvation for mankind? How can you do, he wasn't talking about quality. In quality, you're gonna do greater things. He was talking about in quantity, you're gonna do greater things. So if we bring that into the church, fast forward now, it's our season, it's our time, we're responsible. You will do greater things than Jesus did because he's releasing you in responsibility in the marketplace and in quantity when we understand what it means to live on mission as the church, we will go and do those things and we will represent Jesus well. I got to stop. I'm over time and I got about eight more slides, but we got to stop. Not going to be that guy tonight. What does it mean to be sent? What does it mean to live on mission? It means that we live a kind of life that demonstrates what we have experienced. That we go and we're witnesses. That we go and we make disciples. How does it start? Let me give you some application. Tomorrow when you go to work, when you step onto the platform that God's given you, step onto that platform understanding the responsibility that you have. The people are crowded around your life. And if you didn't know that, you've got a crowd of people that watch you. Now you may look at them and go, I don't like that person. They don't like me. They were mean to me in the meeting the other day. That stuff doesn't matter. What matters is for you to understand your responsibility and role in the platform that God's given you. They may not like you. They may not understand why they may not like you. They, but don't worry about that. What you need to be worried about is showing them Jesus so that they can fall in love with the Jesus in you. Where does it start? It starts tomorrow in the marketplace. It starts when you wake up tomorrow and understand that you are on mission. That's God's call in your life. You are sent to wherever you drive to work tomorrow. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. God, thanks for tonight. Man, what a great group of people here this evening. And I thank you for the opportunity um, from this teaching platform just to open your word and to talk about this idea of mission. Help us to get that. Help us to be a church that's truly surrendered. Um, Help us to be individuals who understand what it means to be responsible in the short season of time that you've graced us with. We call life, but it's about a mission. And, And being in a relationship with you and being on mission are inseparable. When we said yes to you, in Jesus, we said yes to the mission. So help us live it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you and have a great week.